Hey, good morning, Lake Tomahawk Bible Church. Good to see you this morning. Good to see some familiar faces returning to the North Woods. Welcome, welcome. I'd like to start our service this morning with just reading uh, Psalm 40. As I was just reading that this week, and it really encouraged me. And I'd love us to just get in that place where we're waiting on the Lord and we're giving our burdens to Him and just preparing our hearts for worship, preparing our hearts for a message and to worship Him. So I'm just going to read this. So if you just let this soak in the Word of God, Psalm 40. If you'd like to follow along or just listen, just uh, let this... God, uh, God's Word says to meditate on His Word. And this psalm this week has really encouraged me. just want to share it with you. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the, next, from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My inequities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O, o Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, Aha, aha. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Let's pray. Father, you are great and mighty and worthy to be praised. We praise you this morning that, that even us, even this small body of folks here, you take thought for us, even for me, even for us. You delight in us. You sing over us. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace that has covered us. We thank you for the grace that will cover all those who say yes to Jesus Christ and his saving work. We desire to worship you this morning, Lord, and we lay our burdens at your feet. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's sing. Let's stand and sing together. Your, in your insert is Jesus' name above all names. Let's sing that together and stand if you're able. Above all names, 
beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer, living Word. Jesus, loving Shepherd, vine of the branch, God, Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor, Lord of the Universe, Light of the World. Praise Him, Lord above all Lords, King above all Kings, God's only Son. by his spirit comes to live in us pastor and friend if you would flip over to great is the lord on the next part of your insert we'll sing that together holy and just by his power we trust in his love great is the lord he is faithful and true by his mercy he proves he is love great is the lord and worthy of glory great is the lord and worthy of praise great is the lord now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. First one. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, by his mercy he proves he is love. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of glory. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice. Great are you, Lord. over to Jack this morning. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome to Lake Tomahawk Bible Church. Hi. Thank you. Good morning back to you. I have announcements this morning and um, before I start with the annou uh, announcements and then move into prayer requests, uh, I want to share with you a scripture passage that has been um, laying on my shoulders all week. It's the one I learned about 47 years ago. And about 45 years ago, I was helping another young man remember this verse. And I always do my scripture memory in New American Standard, but he insisted on using King James. So we were in a factory setting, and I was helping him learn this verse in, in a very dramatic way to make it easier. And uh, so we began like this. What? Know ye not that the body, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have within you, and that you are not your own? You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And I was thinking about that all week long, and um, I've been asked to do a lot of things that make me uncomfortable. <laughs> you can see that, right? And um, I'm doing things during the week that I haven't done for a long time, and my body is screaming. Um, I'm being uh, reacqu uh, reacquainted with my ancientness. And, um, but God is really good, and he is our owner if we're believers in Christ. 
he is the one in charge, and I commented during a conversation midweek with some men, isn't it strange that we probably don't wake up very often and say, what is it you have for me today, Lord? What would you want me to do today, and how would you want me to think? How would you like me to speak, Lord? And that we probably don't think like that enough as followers of Christ, but I think Old and New Testament both resound with the message that if we're under a covenant with our, the living God, that he is our owner. We've been bought with a price. And so that's our situation as believers in Christ, and it's a blessed place to live. So I was reminded of that this week. So here I am doing announcements, and um, I'm not going to lead singing. Um, but if you turn to your announcements in the bulletin, um, I notice we have... Uh, Three Bible studies, and we have Awanas available during the week. Tim, you don't have a location for your Bible study? Eversons. Eversons, okay. And so if the Bible study, study leaders would raise their hands and Awana leader, if you're interested in those, these are the people you see. There's Tim. And Larry is not here, that's right. So if you see, there's phone numbers. We have availability of phone numbers for you to make contact and attend those Bible studies if you're interested. And of course, Awanas. And um, so under the announcement category on your bulletin, you can read those. Sweater Wearers Club, Awanas Grill Out Night. That sounds very interesting if you like to eat. And water fights. Water fights? Yes. That sounds good for the men. Um, <laughs> elders meeting. Uh, looks like the date is up for grabs. Uh, Probably be Monday, what day? The 17th is also that if we don't want to that Okay, so, so probably the 17th, and if uh, you would like to attend, please contact an elder. Yes. 16th. Monday the 16th. 16th, I'm sorry. Um, New Dawn Pregnancy Center, there's an announcement there of the amount of money we collected for uh, the baby bottled boomerang collection. That's, that's very good. And more announcements on the back of the bulletin. I guess I better look at that. If I can turn. Child sponsorship. Uh, Mary, do you want to say something about that? You want to come up? Looks like sponsorship is $25 per month, $75 for a quarter, and $354 for the entire year. I don't have a newsletter. Well, I just wanted to announce that um, eight children were um, picked up to be sponsored. So uh, we're really excited about that. Um, there's a mission committee report uh, if people are interested. And there's a newsletter from Tony. I don't remember if I announced last week that um, 63 people are going to his outdoor church right now, and 59 people were converted um, altogether. And it started out that he only had 10 kids going to his Bible club, and then it moved up to 60 kids going to Bible club, and now he has 110 kids going to Bible club. So uh, they're making a huge impact in the community, and by having the 25 children that go to school, uh, the people in the community are very surprised because the kids go back home, they listen to their parents, they do chores, and they're starting to read and write. And this makes a huge difference in the homes. And so all the people in the community are very interested in the Christian school. And so that's why I think 110 children have showed up. <laughs> so um, I just want you to know that investing in um, Lays on Glaze Ministries is having a huge impact in that community. So I just want to thank you.
Also, for announcements, uh, we are building a new building, folks, and it's well underway, and I have some updates. They're not maybe significant from the visual standpoint, but they literally did happen. Last week, I reported to you on some twine that's being installed to hold insulation in place. I have an accurate measure as of today. We have installed a total of 4.18 miles of twine using 14,700 plus staples so far. More to come. Um, framing is continuing. Um, the cut list that Steve had left with us last week has been completed, so there's more framing to take place, a finale of sorts. Um, Blocking for the bathroom walls, uh, requested by Todd. One bathroom is done. We have two to go. For the safety uh, fixtures, the grab bars and such, uh, that's being accomplished. Um, there's another project underway at the building that anybody who can walk could probably participate in. And I have begun a process of cleaning room by room the dust from all the saws, all the insulation, the shop vacs are in the building. There's a couple there. If you have one, you may want to bring one. And we're vacuuming out the walls, the floors, high and low, the sawdust. So it's eliminated from the building and won't affect our heating system and the filters. So that's something that really needs to take place before the insulation goes, gets finished and the wallboard goes on. So if you're available and you'd like something really interesting to do to find out how many places dust can hide, let me know. Uh, the VACs will be available. If you have some, we might want to team up and do it together. Have a great big party and bring a lunch and have some fellowship. Um, what else? Um, the pressure's on our project manager for the wiring and the insulation. We're drawing close to the end of the framing. So we're getting excited. Everybody probably has a picture in their mind when we're moving in to the new building. So. Um, but all this has to happen first. And so the wallboard will have to go on, but the insulation, the wiring. And so I'm glad our elders, some of our elders are here today. I was told that I had multiple roles this morning because there would be no elders. And I have, have two present and one was here earlier. So, um, which reminds me, our elders are extremely busy. They have lives beyond the, the work in our congregation and God has provided those jobs. And I'm aware that Tim's on a job this morning and that Steve has been working long, long hours. Tim's got responsibilities he's taken on. Uh, every good gift comes down from the Father of lights above, the scripture says. And if God is providing for our families through these gifts of employment and, and to um, the ministry of the word through ministry outside of the, the body here, we need to be giving thanks, but also praying for our elders. Please do that. They're working hard and they're working hard on our behalf at the same time. So uh, let's do that. And those are our announcements for the morning. And um, next on our agenda, a song, an insert. Back to you. If you could stand and grab your insert, and we're going to sing, I Love You, Lord. Take 
joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Grab your red hymnal, and we're going to flip to 492. Jesus loves even me, 492. loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee When I remember that Jesus loves me I am so glad that Jesus loves me Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me I am so glad that Jesus loves me Jesus loves even me Oh, if there's only one song I can sing When in his beauty I see the great King This shall my song in eternity be Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me I am so glad that Jesus loves me Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves even me. And children are dismissed to Children's Church. You can have a seat. Now that's settled. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning, and I was aware when I got to the back of the room that I had neglected to do prayer requests, and um, we had a presentation by Mary uh, regarding the children in Haiti, and um, we need to remember to pray for that ministry there, and um, Mary. I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I need a microphone. <laughs> I just wanted to announce that Tony's wife, Jenna, is having a lot of health issues. She's feeling very weak and faint, and um, I would like to request um, prayer for her specifically because um, she's struggling with her health, and if you could keep her in prayer. Uh, they have a little bit longer for school, and then I hope she gets to have a long break so she can build her strength back up. So uh, if you could keep her in prayer. Thank you. Anything else? Amanda. If you were here last week, I took a couple prayer requests and I neglected to pray for them here. I fell on my knees at home and, and gave those to the Lord there. So I'm going to take time to pray for these first and then we'll pray for ourselves as we sit under the teaching and instruction from God's word through Will Lowry and um, pray for him as well. Um, try to remember this week, if you can, maybe even 
look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 and realize who our owner is. We've been purchased for a price and, and that he's in command. And so many times we live our lives as if we're in command. He really is, even if we follow Christ and at times deny it. And um, We have a world out there who haven't given themselves to Christ, and he's really in charge of their lives as well, but they haven't made a commitment. And our goal is to see some of those folks, as many as the Lord can direct his way to receive Jesus Christ and fall under that sovereign rule willingly while they're still walking this globe. Let's pray. Father, thank you that uh, you are sovereign, even though uh, even sometimes we as believers forget that or even with our behavior tend to deny that. Um, I am so glad that you have purchased me and purchased every follower of Christ, and you have more purchases to make as we walk this earth yet. Father, we pray for those who uh, walk about this earth separated from you that... Um, somehow that you enact your will to get their attention and, and that we um, pray for them to have softened hearts um, in a world in which declares personal sovereignty, Lord, for the most part. Father, thank you for um, Tony and his wife's ministry in, in Haiti. And like us, Tony's wife has a physical body that ails and um, she's needing your tender care and encouragement and, and, and strength to finish that walk which you have for her to do in, in her life and, and in Tony's life. Thank you for that ministry and uh, show them fruit because they've recognized your ownership and are grateful. Thank you for uh, the prayer of our young ones for their friends, for uh, their well-being, for their health, and, and for their spiritual health, for salvation. Thank you that you can raise up still children in families with, with parents who belong to you and who are raising their children for the next generation uh, of your church, Lord, to carry on the ministry as long as you will. Father, thank you for uh, what we call the body of Christ local here in Lake Tom Bible Church and, and for all those bodies all around our globe, some who have already met and are in the latter part of their, their Sundays. We belong to you, Lord, and, uh, and just acknowledging that along with praise and worship and thanksgiving daily, Lord, always giving thanksgiving for your tender, loving kindness, for your direction, and even for your direction to abide in your word and to live it out as servants of the living God, because that's the best way for us to perform our lives, and it's prosperity awaiting us, Lord, as we step out in faith and walk with you. Thank you that we are privileged to sit in freedom and hear your word and have the, the Spirit of God living within us as believers to help us to understand and recall scripture to us as happened to me this past week. You brought those scriptures to mind because you had a purpose in them and you have a purpose in what we're going to hear today. So I pray for us, Lord, as we sit under Will's teaching, that your spirit have, has his way with us, and that as Will shares your message with us, that you be real time with him and encouraging him and, and using him in a mighty way. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Well, hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, as I as had been mentioned earlier, my name is Will Lowry. Um, I am currently living over in Sugar Camp right now uh, with my in-laws uh, as my family, and I plan on moving to the UK hopefully in a month, um, assuming paperwork all goes through. Uh, so. I guess a thing to be praying for as well, if you could pray that uh, we would have bureaucratic favor, uh, that'd be great. Uh, but, but we're hoping to be able to go in early to mid-June. And while we're there, we're going to be serving uh, with various different church plants and church planting organizations in the city of Birmingham uh, with a, a special focus on 
being able to just see what does it look like for us to reach uh, the massive Muslim population in the city of Birmingham. Uh, currently, it's it's approaching about a third Muslim um, and has the the largest Eid festival in Europe, Eid, Eid being the holiday that celebrates the end of Ramadan. Um, and, and so there's just this, this massive spiritual kind of darkness in the city. And, um, and so we would love if you would be praying for us as well. And if you're interested in, in hearing any more about that, like come chat to me or to my wife right over here. Um, but today's uh, not, not about me sharing about that ministry that we plan to be doing, but, but about looking at the Word of God. Um, so if you would uh, join me in prayer uh, once again. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you um, that you are a good God. Lord, as we're going to see in this passage, we, we thank you that you are the God who sees us. You, you are the God who hears us. You are the God who, who draws near to us in times of joy and in times of hardship. And so, Father, as we hear your word, as we continue through our service, as we enjoy fellowship with one another, would, would we just encounter you? Would, would we be uh, wrapped up in your presence? In Jesus' name, amen. And so, let's see, there we go. As I, as I was trying to figure out, like, what, what am I going to preach um, about? Because that's always the most difficult thing for me in um, going to a church that I don't know uh, anybody in, is uh, trying to figure out, like, what, what should I share um, with this group of people? And I was driving along and heard an advertisement two weeks ago that said May 8th was Mother's Day. And I was like, oh, that's really good to know. Uh, and so if you weren't aware, uh, husbands, um, today is Mother's Day, uh, you know, get your wife something. Uh, but, but I decided like, oh, that, that's probably a great place to have something kind of topical, something uh, revolving around just the idea uh, of mothers and motherhood. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge that Mother's Day isn't uh, always a, an easy day. Um, while, while it's definitely a day culturally, we, we want to honor and we want to celebrate the, the mothers in our lives. It's also a very complicated holiday for a lot of people. And, and so it can be complicated because in, even in this room maybe, but certainly all around us, there, there's going to be people who are experiencing the joys of this being the first Mother's Day where they have a child. And then there's also going to be people who are experiencing this as the first Mother's Day where their mom is gone. There, there's going to be people being reminded of how wonderful their own mother was and people reminded of her absence or of her abuses. There's going to be people who are reminded of their own shortcomings in parenting or also being reminded of the children they don't have but desire. Days like today can be incredibly complicated. They can elicit joy and sorrow. They can elicit mourning and celebration, honor and shame. And they can be happiness and anger. And much of the times there's uncomfortable mixes of all of those things coming together, of celebrating and also being sorrowful. Um, just to, to give a, a personal example, um, I, I haven't spoken to her yet because she's behind in time zones, um, but I know for my own mom, this is going to be the first Mother's Day uh, that she'll be celebrating uh, without her oldest son. And so there's going to be complicated emotions there. And, and so wherever you are today, and, and this includes both women and men, mothers and not mothers, I... My, my prayer is that we would have a blessed Mother's Day. And, and because it, it might not be happy, you might not want to say happy Mother's Day. Uh, it, it may not feel that. But, but today is still a day that we can come before God with our emotions, with our hardships, or with our joys in the messiness of life. And, and we can encounter God amidst all of that. And, and so, uh, in a way, to uh, kind of try to be able to honor uh, 
Mother's Day, uh, be able to honor this cultural holiday while also being able to recognize uh, the, the hardships that, that might come with it for some people. I decided to look at a incredibly messy and complicated story of two mothers in Scripture. And, and these are arguably two of the most important mothers in all of history. Entire nations trace their family line to these two moms, one of these two moms. The, the religion of 50% of the world sees these mothers as their spiritual moms, uh, as their matriarchs. That, that's 3.8 billion people have some sort of tie to one of these two women. And so today we're going to look at a story of Hagar and Sarah uh, found in Genesis chapter 16. Uh, of course, feel free to just listen along or, or to follow along in your Bible. Uh, but, but we're going to look at their story and Really, it's not a complicated passage. Um, there, there's not a lot of things where I have to explain what does this mean, I have to look at Hebrew words, anything like that. And, and so really, we're just going to spend some time uh, being able to look at like, what, what is going on in this, because it can be so easy to read Scripture and, and read it kind of as this flat thing and say, oh, that's a nice story, uh, w- without spending the time to think, like, Man, what, what did this actually look like in this moment? for these people. So again, uh, Genesis chapter 16. And we're just going to kind of walk through it, uh, one, one or two verses at a time. And so it starts off with Oh, also, I'm just going to say this up front. I'm going to mix up uh, Sarai and Sarah and Abram and Abraham probably a bunch. Well, I'm sure just forgive me for that. At this point, God has not yet renamed them, um, and so their names are Sarai and Abram. Um, and so if I mess that up, just I ask your forgiveness in that. Uh, it's just natural to say Sarah and Abraham. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, so verse one starts, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. And, and so to give some background to this, uh, ten years prior to this, at the uh, young age of 75 years old, uh, Abraham, Abram was told by God, go to the land which I will show you, to the land of Canaan, and I will make a great nation out of you. And, and he promises him that he will have these descendants who, who will become this mighty nation which will inherit the land of Canaan. And so they went there, and, and they have been traveling for ten years Abram is 85 now, Sarah is 75 now, and, and they're still without children. And, and just to complicate things a little bit more, as if that's not difficult enough, wondering, God, how are you going to fulfill this promise when we definitely are long past the age of being able to have children? To, to complicate it even more, there's a point where there's a famine in the land, and so they went down to Egypt and while they were in Egypt, uh, Abram had Sarai promise him, don't tell anyone that you're my wife. Tell them that you're my sister. And if you're familiar with the story during that time, Pharaoh comes to Sarai and takes her into his house and takes her as a wife. And, and she doesn't say anything. Abram doesn't say anything, but, but God causes there to be disease and sickness in Pharaoh's household. And and so eventually Pharaoh comes up to Abram and says, why didn't you tell me that this was your wife? Like, I wouldn't have done this. But during that time, they gather uh, a lot of property, uh, a lot of cattle, and they also gather quite a few slaves that they take back with them to Canaan. And so most likely, one of those slaves is, as we see in verse 1 here, Sarai's Egyptian maidservant, Hagar. Hagar. And so currently we have this messiness. Sarah hasn't been able to bear children. And so instead she says, here, take this Egyptian slave that that came out of this country that that we forced to move to this new place. And she says to Abram in verse 2, so she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And so... 
At first we see the Lord has kept me from having children. There, there's some degree of faith here. Um, I, I want to be careful to not just make uh, Sarai or to make Hagar or to make Abram just bad all around. Uh, but, but also want to be careful to not make them unbelievably good and, and to ignore these hard, difficult portions of their life. And, and so Sarah has this little bit of faith. She's like, the, the Lord has prevented me from having children. She, she's placing the reason why she can't have kids in the right area. She's not blaming herself. She's not blaming wrong that she's done, anything of that sort. She's saying, no, the Lord has done this for some reason. I don't understand why. And so she decides to take it into her own hands. And I, I, will, I will fix this by giving you my slave so that way you can sleep with her. And it says, perhaps I can build my family through her. And, and just to, to, to take a, another step back there, imagine what this must be like for Hagar. They, this was a fairly common thing in, in ancient culture in this area for, for a maidservant to be given to the husband uh, to be able to bear additional children. And, and so this isn't some wild thing for this time. But, but still imagine the, the place that Hagar's in there. She, she was in Egypt, bought as a slave, taken to a foreign land, and is now being given to this 85-year-old man to have his children that once the child's weaned, it'll be taken from her and given to her mistress. What, what an incredibly difficult place Hagar is in. I can't imagine the, the complex emotions and sorrow that would come with that. And so it, it continues, Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. So there's all kinds of stuff going on here. Um, there's there's polygamy, there's, uh, let's just say Hagar, her consent didn't matter in this. Um, she, she didn't have a choice. And arguably, I, I'm going to use this word loosely, but kind of kidnapping. It, it will be Hagar's child, but the plan is to take her, take her child from her to give to Sarai. And so there, there's a lot of issues going on. And, and so it says that after she conceives, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. That seems pretty understandable to me. Uh, through, throughout history, people have looked at this verse and have seen Hagar as being evil or being wicked or, or being the epitome of sin or something like that. And, and maybe some of those things are true. Maybe there is sin wrapped up in this, but, but it just seems understandable that, that she would despise, that she would look down on Sarai for, for the things which that family had done to her. And, and so Sarai ends up uh, saying... Uh, to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. And, and so Sarai has gone from this moment of, of she, she's in pain, she's in sorrow of not having any children, and especially what that means in ancient cultures. If a woman w was without child, she'd She's useless is kind of the way that they saw it. And, and so she has this hardship, and, and so she gives her, her slave woman to Abram so that way she can have a child. And then finally, Hagar conceives, and then Sarah begins to regret it. And, and she sees the way that Hagar acts, and, and she says, Abram, why would you do this to me? Why would you allow this to happen? And we can look at that as ridiculous, because it kind of is, and, but we can also recognize, I mean, what, what pain and hardship must Sarai be going through amidst all of this? And so Abram responds to her in verse 6, your slave is in your hands, Abram said, do with her whatever you think best. And I'll just say to this, like, Abram refers to her as your slave is in your hands, but two verses earlier we see that Hagar was given to him as his wife. 
The answer isn't, your slave is in your hands, do whatever you want. The answer should be, that's my wife. That, that is the mother of my soon-to-be child. Uh, but, but Abram just kind of passively instead, just, okay, do, do whatever you want. And, and so we see Sarah begins to abuse and, and to mistreat Hagar. It says, then she mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. And, and so Hagar runs away and starts heading west, back to Egypt, uh, through, through the desert of Shur. And in verse 7 says, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. Now, uh, it refers to the angel of the Lord here. If you're familiar, this is a complicated uh, person in the Bible. Nobody really knows 100% for sure what the angel of the Lord means. Some people believe it's Jesus before he came to earth. It's the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, Some people believe it's a manifestation of the Father in some way. Um, Some people say it's just a messenger from God. but, But what we do know is when the Bible refers to the angel of the Lord, people bow down and worship this angel. People attribute characters of God to this angel, and it doesn't correct them. So, so in some way uh, that I don't understand, this is God himself appearing to Hagar by the spring. And he says to her, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? To which Hagar responds, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. I, I may be reading into this, but, but she only answers one of the questions, where have you come from? And, and he asks, his, where are you going? And, and it makes me think she doesn't really have a plan at this point. She, she is fleeing for potentially her own life, for the life of, of her child, and, and hasn't quite thought this out entirely and, and is in this desert waiting by a spring. And this is where God decides to visit her. And the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. And and so God says to Hagar this incredibly difficult thing, no, go back to Sarai. Continue to sit under her abuses continue to sit under her hardship. But he also gives her this promise of, I will increase your descendants so that way they can't even be numbered. What, what a difficult thing to hear at first, but also what a joyous thing to know that her child's going to be okay. Not only that, but that she's going to have an entire nation coming from her. And then verse 11 says, The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant. You will give birth to a son, and you shall name him him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. And and so God gives her this promise of, Yes, you you are going to have a son, and his name's going to be Ishmael. Uh, which Ishmael means God hears. And, and it says, because I have heard your misery. And, and so first we have this thing where we recognize amidst all of this, amidst all of this pain which Hagar has been going through, God hears it. God, God is present and, and God chooses to come and to visit her in her greatest time of need. And, and he also gives this promise about her son if he's going to be a wild donkey of a man and, and he's always going to be at enmity with his brothers. And, and that's a promise from God which is still true to this day. Uh, the kind of entire Arab uh, group of people trace their descendant back through Ishmael. And, and as you know, if you've read scripture or, or even just looking at the news, there, there is constantly fighting an enmity between the people of Israel and between the Arab nations around them. And and so God gives her this promise, uh, yes, you are going to have a son, but but there's also kind of a hardship that comes with that. And then it says in verse 13, and and really this is the verse, it's in the pamphlet, this is the one that I want us to, to hang on to. Says so she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. 
You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well there is called Be'er Lahai Roi, which is still there between Kadesh and Bered. And, and the name of that well, Be'er Lahai Roi, I, means the well of the living one who sees me. And, and so she named this spring, named this well, after God, after how he sees her in her plight and in her hardship. And the chapter ends, so Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael. And, and so, I'm going to take this off. All right, and so, at 86 years old, Abram finally has this child. And, and Hagar finally has this child as well. But, but as we noticed earlier, there is so many complicated things that are going on with this. There, there's the enmity between Hagar and between Sarai. There, there's abuses, there's slavery, there's, there's being moved to a new place, there's being a foreigner. There, there is so much incredible hardship for this new mother. But it says here in verse 13 that she gave this name to the Lord. You are the God who sees me. And God accepted that name. If we look throughout all of Scripture, there, there's these times of, of people being able to name things. And, and it gives this idea of them, them having power over them, uh, of this sort of authority. And, and we see in Genesis, uh, Adam gets to name every single, ad, every single animal. And then Adam gets to name Eve as woman. And then Adam gives her the name Eve after the fall and then they name their children, and, and we see all of this, but, but here Hagar gives God a name. You are the God who sees me. Elohim Roi, I believe, is the, the Hebrew. And, and she gives God a name, and God accepts it, and, and he lets it remain in his word, and he lets this well, this spring, be named after this name which Hagar had given him. Throughout all of Scripture, she is the first person to name God, and she's the only person to give God a name. This unwanted, abused slave woman with an illegitimate child is the only person God allows to give him a name. And, and she says, you are the God who sees me. Uh, amidst all of this, Hagar is able to recognize God is still present with me in this. She's able to have reason to rejoice, to, to exclaim, to praise the Lord, for he is the God who sees her, and he is the God who hears her. And so really, that's, that's why I want to share this story, is I don't know where it is that you are right now. I, I don't know if Mother's Day is a day of celebration, a day of sorrow, if it's just a, any other day and you don't care about it. But of all the things we have going on in life, uh, of the real hardships and joys and everything in between, we can know that God is the one who sees us. We, we worship the God who hears us. We worship the God who sees us. And that in all of this pain and all of this suffering and all of this joy, we can come to him and we can be in his presence. So, so often, uh, it's, it's easy to come to church and, and put on that, you know, kind of happy face, everything's going great. Uh, or or to, to only sort of think of these positive parts of Christian living, the, these happy parts of it. But the truth is God is present in all of life, and, and I think we see this perfectly here with Hagar. It's in this deepest, darkest, hardest time that God is most present with her. And, and he doesn't tell her first, no, 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 you need to stop having pain, you need to be happy, you need to rejoice, and then I'll be present with you. Instead, he comes in this moment, and Hagar is able to name him and say, you are the God who sees me and to take peace in that, enough peace for her to return back 
to Abram and to Sarai. And so I just want to say this. God is the God who sees you, wherever you are. He sees you. He hears you. As you cry out to him, as you turn your back and refuse to cry out to him, he still sees and he still hears us and he is present with us. And that ultimately is where our hope needs to be. But the story doesn't end here, um, as we all know. It, It doesn't just end with this time of hardship and God kind of showing up and saying, I'm with you. Uh, and then that being the end of it. Uh, instead, we get to see throughout all Scripture that amidst hardship, amidst the, the messiness and the difficulty of just real life, God redeems all things. And so in the next chapter, in, in chapter 17, verse 19, we get to see that Sarah, Sarai, gets to be redeemed. And so it says in verse 19, then God said to Abraham, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear a son and you will call him Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. God gives this promise of no, I am still going to follow through on the thing which I said 10 years before you came to Canaan. And this is actually 14 years later. And so at this point, Abram is 100 years old Sarah is 90 years old, and and God tells him, no, 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 I'm still going to come through on what I have said. And in a year, in fact, I'm going to come back, and Sarah is going to have a child born to her. And he says, it will be through this child that I will establish my covenants, that I will eventually reach the entire world, and as we know, which Christ, our salvation, will eventually come through. And if we just look at the beginning of this story, Sarah doesn't deserve that. Abram doesn't deserve that, but God, in his grace, he still gives them this. And then in the next verse, it also says, and for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. God, even even through Ishmael, blesses and he redeems Hagar, and, and she goes from being this unwanted slave woman to being the mother of nations, to, to the mother of 12 kings, to uh, as now we, we see the mother of Islam. And, and if you're familiar, Islam traces its roots back through Ishmael, and, and so their, their spiritual connection with Hagar and with Abraham through that. She, she gets this incredible blessing if you will be seen as the mother of this massive nation. And so God redeems all things. And, and beautifully, what, what we get to see right now is God redeeming, I mean, Hagar and, and the, the people that have come from her in, in new and incredible ways. I, in, in the last 20 years, there have been more Muslim people who have come to Christ than there has been in the 1,500 years before that. And, and so while it took a long time, and, and we see for generations and millennia, this enmity between God's people and between the children of Hagar, we, we now get the joy of being able to see God reuniting them, uh, of God reconciling all people to himself. And, and so that's I mean, as I said earlier, we're, we're looking at church planting in some of the Muslim-majority parts of Birmingham. And it's for that reason, what, what a joy to see even these people who were sworn to be at enmity with God's people being able to enter into his family. And so God redeems all things. And so again, I just want to say wherever you are, Look to the God who sees you. Look to the God who hears you. And look to the Lord who redeems all things. He doesn't promise it's going to be a quick fix. Sarah had to wait another 14 years until she got her promised son. 
Ishmael had to wait 3,000 years until his descendants started becoming a part of the family of God. And so God doesn't promise it's going to be a quick fix, but he does promise he will have his presence with you along the way. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you um, for your word. And God, I thank you that it, it shows the complexities, it shows the messiness, it shows the hardships of life. And that mixed within those, we see how you are redeeming all things, of how you make all things new. Not in our time. And, and so, Lord, we, we ask, would you um, move us to be able to trust in who you are, in, in whatever things each one of us in this congregation might be facing today and this next week. Lord, would you remind us that you are the God who sees us, that amidst all of those things, you are present and that you are working in ways which we can't even imagine. And Lord, we thank you for Sarah and we thank you for Hagar. And we thank you for Abraham and, and for the examples that they are, are able to be to us, um, both in kind of their, their wickedness, but, but also in their trust in you. And so, Lord, would we, would we take their lead to, to trust in you as, as we have one of the most famous declarations of Scripture that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Lord, would we believe and would we trust in you, knowing that ultimately that is the thing which matters most. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Will. Um, please remain seated. We have a special presentation in a few moments. Um, Will and, and Kate, um, I know that you're on your road to a mission in following the instruction of your Lord, and um, you know it's not all going to be easy. Um, Diane and I have been in the presence of ministry to Muslims in Bulgaria. Though it's not all easy, God sees you, and he will see you wherever you are and whatever you're doing. There will be fruit as you walk with him. Uh, we saw numerous Muslims baptized in the name of Christ. We saw Muslims who, at that point in our lives, had still resisted receiving Jesus Christ, but they continued to come and hear the good news. So uh, God sees and um, he's that kind of God. So um, we have a special presentation from Kate and the girls, but um, I guess I'd like to do a closing prayer and then we'll open it up for Kate and, and the children and, and Mike Hawk. And, um, so let's just uh, pray for this couple as they follow the leadership of the one who is in charge of their lives and show us that example. Father, um, you're seeing us right now. You, you know the, the times that are coming, uh, which we may face difficulty, we may face rich blessings and, and be able to um, understand them as they happen. But always we uh, seek to bring you delight with our loyalty and our gaining knowledge of your character and your person through real-time experience with you. As we as a, a church here in Lake Tom, as individuals who have a Savior, may we go and live our lives in a way now this week, these coming days, even these coming minutes and hours as we part from one another in a way that brings delight to your person. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Kate.
Good morning, everybody, and a blessed Mother's Day to everybody. Um, to echo uh, Will's message, um, I'm going to read a poem or an ode to uh, women, mothers, and ladies this morning. Bear with me if I stumble or get misty-eyed, I apologize. But bear with me. But this is The Wide Spectrum of Mothering. Um, to those who gave birth this year to their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with the little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss or have experienced loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we also walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make this harder than it really is. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have had disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experience abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who live through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who've aborted children, we remember them, and we remember you on this day. To those who are single and long to be married, and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you longed for it to be. To those who step-parent, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those who envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream is not to be, we also grieve with you. To those who have emptier nests in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who place children up for adoption, we commend you and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart. And we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you, every one of you. And now if we could have all the ladies, every lady over the age of 18, stand up if you don't mind. Everyone. I am the Iwana leader so I can get boisterous, but let's get up. And <laughs> we have some.